Hello guys and welcome to the RCZ on a very warm English day. In fact, I think it has been the warmest this summer altogether. So I apologise, I am looking like Prince Andrew, sweaty and wet. Now, it ain't about me, it's about the car today. Now, what I'm going to say, again, I do apologise with this video. We're going to get a lot of excess noise in here because I've got to have my windows open because the AC <laughs> doesn't work. Um, and... I am sweating like crazy, so I do apologize for any excess noise because the windows are open. This kind of van is dropping like a fucking imbecile. Fuck's sake. Right, <laughs> not a good start. So I'm here today to review my Peugeot RCZ Asphalt. This Asphalt is a special version of basically the GT and the GT has the THP 200 engine. Now not all GTs do, but the important thing to recognize is there's two petrol engines in the RCZ and that the 200 is the better engine. So as I'm driving, as you can see, I'm actually heading down to go and clean the car because it got really dirty today after being sat in the dust and it being and it raining today all over it. So I'm driving down now to go and get the car clean, which we'll see in a bit. And then we'll talk about the car inside and out when we get there. But for now, we're gonna talk about the dynamics of the car and how it is. So the first thing we're going to mention is that this car turns heads. Now, whether you're stock or whether you're modified, it turns heads. In my opinion, it's a beautiful car. And in a lot of other people's opinions, it's a very interesting and beautiful car. Now, when it comes to actually driving it, if you're looking for comfort, don't buy one. And I'm being honest. Now, <laughs> mine's on lowering springs which exaggerates the problem. And you probably can't see it now, um, but it is very bumpy. If you want comfort, this isn't really the car for you. This is more orientated towards being a excellent driver. You know, a B-road twisty, you know, and it's designed to be comfortable when you're cruising on the motorway, but anywhere else, especially in Bristol anyway, where the roads are diabolical, you will find the car is very, very, uncomfortable especially if you go lower it like i have which makes it even worse now putting the comfort aside the car drives blissfully now i've driven quite a few cars in my years now and i can tell you that the rcz is the best handling front wheel drive car i have ever driven um, obviously this has benefited from the lowering springs i put on the car but already as the car is stock it is an incredibly handling awesome car to drive now i'm going to say this a lot in the video but this car is underrated it really is and there's not really many cars that sit up against this in the category it's in you know you've got your tt and that's really about it but actually this car sits in the bracket of your fiesta sts you know your gti's and your vehicles like that you know so when you look at the rcz sat next to a couple of fiestas or sat next to a astra or a golf it does really stand out now, on top of the impeccable handling, this engine, when it's running properly, we'll get onto that in a bit. <laughs> this engine is really zesty. Now, it's a 1.6 four cylinder with Vanos and a tiny little turbo that gets very hot, but does push the car, well, pull the car, in fact, along very well. The noises it makes also are very unlike a little 1.6 four part as well. You would expect it to be quite raspy, but actually it's got a nice low growl to it. And it really does have a nice zesty pull as you go through the rev range. You'll hear a bit of that as we go up the dual carriageway here anyway. Now, I never sent this car in the heat. Because we're going to talk about why that is. Now, these cars suffer quite badly from heat. I'm going to have to close the window as well. So, they suffer real bad in the heat. Now, this is because of the intake design. This is because of the fact that the turbo is in the front of the engine and it does get very hot. It's the way the engine is. Now, we've just got prepared in the summer. These cars do suffer from heat. Now, there are modifications you can put in place, which I will discuss later on in the video, that will help this. And what this review is going to be is a very fair statement of good and bad. Because overall, actually, this car is really incredible. And we'll get to that at the end. But I want to talk about everything I can possible in this video so everyone's really informed as to why you should or shouldn't get one of these. 
So we've discussed the comfort. As you can probably tell, the soundproofing quality of the vehicle isn't also the best either. So I appreciate I've got a loud exhaust, but I'm having to now sit here and sweat like Prince Andrew in a fish and chip, fish and chip shop because of how noisy the car is. Even with the window slightly ajar, it makes quite a lot of noise in here. So just be prepared that unlike maybe a TT, this is a cheaper built car. This is a cheaper car built to a budget. Now, the engine Zesty is a great engine. The handling is superb. The, the steering wheel is, I would say, slightly light, but it does pick up feedback as you go a bit faster. The gearbox on this, uh, the six speed on this 200 THP is just amazing. It's really notchy, but the gears for a stock box are really close. It's just a really nice feeling car to sit in. Now, what goes really well with it as well is the lower center of gravity, the low sloping windows, the low window, the smaller steering wheel, all these little things come together to make the experience really enjoyable. So overall for drivability, if you disregard the comfort, this is an amazing car to drive. It drives so well. And you will find, you know, with a few very simple mods that this car in the corners, mark my words, would keep up with much more capable cars. Now, you don't have the straight line performance potentially of a bigger engine vehicle, but you do definitely have the cornering ability that's way beyond a lot of cars in its category. So, we're gonna talk about specs and features of the vehicle when we park up in a bit, but we're now gonna get on to the daily driving. Now, I find with this car, <laughs> It's actually lovely to drive. Now, I have come from the background of previously owning a Jaguar before this. Now, unfortunately, when you go to a car like this from a Jaguar, you soon realize that things aren't as well built. But everything in here works. Peugeot have this horrible name about them being unreliable, blah, 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 blah. But the Peugeot side, the electronics and things, I can say in this 10-year-old car, that everything works. Everything works great. Um, and actually the interior is held up really well. You'll see around the interior later on. There's no damage, nothing's worn, everything works as it should, um, which says a lot for the build quality of this car, considering they're built to a bit of a cheaper standard than say a TT or other alternatives. Now, I've had an RCZ on my channel before. It was my old diesel. The video is below here. Now I'm gonna quickly talk about the car itself. Um, it is a car for someone who only has one friend uh, one partner, if that's your thing, whether you have more partners, then that's your loss. Um, and maybe one pet, because if you have anything more than that, you're not going to be getting anyone inside here. Now again, in a little while, I'm going to demonstrate the issues with getting in and out of the car, because there are just a few issues with that. And in terms of practicality, apart from the boot, you haven't really got a lot going for you at all. Just a boot, really. Now, up front, from the driver's perspective at least this car is actually very spacious there's a lot of space on the two front seats and the armrest and the uh, the door design just fits really nicely at least with my driving style there's enough adjustment on the steering wheel the electric seats have got a fair amount of adjustment as well what i do seem to find is if i sit up straight with really good posture which i never do anyway but if i do um, I find, and if you can see by the camera here, but I am a fist, about a fist off the top of the ceiling. Now that's with a seat in its lowest setting. So another problem is I reckon if you're six foot or taller, even with the seat down at the lowest position, I think you're gonna struggle with headroom. Now, I mean, God forbid you take it on the track and have to wear a helmet because you would literally be driving like this down the road, because this is the seat in the lowest setting. And this is me sort of sat up, you know, really stretching myself out, but you can see, it's not a lot of space and that's something I think a lot of drivers to be aware of now that doesn't that's just multiplied as well in the footwell space because I find if I sit in a position now if I can have to squeeze my fat shoes in between the throttle pedals there's not a lot of room between the pedals um, my leg is not stretched out straight and this seat is as fairly as far back as it will go that's comfortable where I've got a good reach on the steering wheel but my feet are also comfortable so what I'm trying to say is is if you're tall the seats and the setup might not be very comfortable for you now 
unfortunately, if you're if you're of a bigger build, um, and you know, it's 2022. Let's just grow up. If you're offended by that, I'm just really being honest because basically, if you're a bit chubby, I'm a bit chubby. But if you're quite excessively chubby, these seats are going to make you feel like a tuna in a can. These sports seats, now they are as different, but in, in this car and pretty much the entire range, um, they're very tight fitting around the waist. Now I'm fine, I'm not, I'm slightly touching the edges, but you know, there's no discomfort there. But what I'm saying is if you're a fairly big build, you're gonna struggle, and I'm talking width wise. Even if you're a big bulky guy, you're gonna find that the back of the seat here is gonna catch on the inside of your shoulder, which is actually rather annoying. You can see how bumping the car is. Um, but the seat apart from that is all right. The adjustments are pretty good. Um, I wish that there was a little bit more support for your lower leg. I wish there was a little bit more adjustment on the angle of the bottom of the seat, because it isn't a lot. But that is really, in all honesty, um, my opinion of the drivability and the performance of this car. Now, I don't think there's anything I forgot to mention there, but what I've said there is very true. And you might think Lewis should be fairly negative, but I'm just being honest about the car because no car is perfect. And you know, name me one, there isn't. But this car does stuff really, really well. And what we're gonna finish off with here to finish off this sort of part of this video is to discuss about the car and what it's like inside. Now, Peugeot made a massive effort with this car to make it a premium feeling vehicle. Now, a lot of you have probably never experienced being one of these or in a Peugeot, but if you go in any of their other models um, throughout this time, you know, they're not very luxurious in inverted commas. Now, what you can probably see in the background here is Peugeot's made an effort with this car. You know, not only did it start on a 308, on a 308 base, they've completely transformed even this interior from the 308 interior that is partially based on this as well. So you've just got features such as this lovely black roof that goes along with the roof and down the side pillars. Now you don't tend to see that on a lot of cheaper cars. That's something you tend to get on some of your BMWs if you spec it up. You tend to get that on higher model vehicles such as my Jag had that and other vehicles like that. There's other things, they've even turned the dials. Now all the Peugeot dials are normally orange at this sort of age, um, but they've changed these dials over to white. Um, in the newer models, they put a more premium gear knob in there. They've made these obviously custom seats for the RCZ. Um, this one, again, you'll see in the video later on, has got the sat nav unit and the JBL sound system. This is all premium stuff, including the leather stitching around the doors and the dashboard. And we've got the clock in the center. Peugeot have really pushed the boat out. We've got things such as ambient lighting down in the footwell. We've got lighting in the door cards when you open the door. It's just things that well features and things have never been on Peugeot's of that age at all you know and it was a big step for Peugeot to really branch out and put themselves at financial risk to build a car like this of this caliber now we'll talk about spec later on but they've also put spec on this car we'll just name a very few basics such as front and rear parking sensors not common on a sort of vehicle in this category this one's got a sound proofed windscreen Acoustic, wind, acoustic windscreen and they've really hit the spot for trying to make this car a bit special compared to the rest so the RCZ is a lot stiffer from the standard 308 chassis that it derived from now you've got to bear in mind again in this category that this car comes as stock with 235 tyres of width um, in an, over an 18 or a 19, depending on what spec you get. Um, the, this GT spec has got 340 mil front calipers. You also got an active spoiler on the back, which actually does produce decent, real downforce. And this all together with the engine makes a car that's basically, practically impossible to lose grip of, especially when you're going at a, a decent speed and that air aero is working on the back of the wing. And um, that's what works with this car to make it so much better than some of your other key components for this vehicle. There's not many other cars that manufacturers have spent this much time and effort into making drive the way it does. And, you know, the stuff I've just mentioned is what makes this car drive as excellent as it does.
does. It is really, really decent. So I have been beaten to the jet wash by this gent. He was here before I got here. So we'll have a little switch up. We'll have a walk around and talk about the car. And then you can see the wash afterwards. So yeah, look, this is the most beautiful corner of the car. Absolutely beautiful. Now mine obviously has a few touches and slightly different from stock, but it applies across the board for the RCZ. A beautiful car. Now here's a spoiler I was talking about. This does actually work and does create very decent downforce. Now this has three settings. You can have it permanently on or off, like I have mine up, a bit of a show off. And then you can have it automatically do it where it will raise the lip halfway up. I think it's at around between 30 and 50 mile an hour. Then it raises it up into this position at around about 100 mile an hour or something like that. So that does work really super well. Now this color on this car is just amazing. Only one of 80 in this trim, but we're not really gonna be speaking about this as such as a trim level today. We're gonna to be talking about the car as a whole. So as you can see, just the side profile of it is amazing. It's such a nice car to look at on the eye. Um, these cars do come with 18s. This one is sat on 19s and it just makes the car look impeccable with that sloping roof line and the rear window like so. Now, it has the looks, but it does also have the practicality to an extent. So if we come in through the side window, you can see that the passenger, or i.e. my bag, and the driver's seat, there is decent, ample room to stretch out in there. Now, when I say decent, that is the only decent, ample room in there, because then we come to this, which really, it's just there for looks. Now, if you see where my driving seat is in my position, and I'm only like 5'8 with shoes on, look, that's being nice to myself. You can see that there's literally no space there for feet unless you don't have any. On top of the fact, you have to be about a metre tall, otherwise you're gonna be having your head molested by <laughs> the window, even though they've curved it slightly to fit someone's head. So, as you can see, practicality isn't too good there. Now, we're gonna come around to the boot. I do apologise, it's gonna be absolutely full of stuff, but it just shows again the practicality. So basically, this boot is so big, you can fit a whole mechanics garage, you can fit your oil, <laughs> your coolant, wraps, uh, a chair, uh, everything else you want in there. Now, below here, obviously, this um, pulls up and you would have normally no spare wheel or a spare wheel, depending on if you're lucky enough to have had one spec from factory. But the boot is very roomy. With this magic handle here, we can pull it through. I'm gonna use the back of my GoPro. Actually, in fact, I'm gonna push you through it. Ready? There we are. Now, what this does is this creates lots of room. It actually makes a slightly unpractical RCZ much more practical so as you can see now there's a lot of room to carry larger items now this simply gets pushed back into position Look at that. there we are so they did provide it with some sort of functionality uh, a glove box which is only half a glove box because they couldn't be asked to change the fuse box over to the other side of the car because they were too busy making onion fucking soup but yeah, decent sized door bins in the car as well. Now, one pet hate, there's only one cup holder. And the cup holder's right here, I'm gonna show you the problem. So as you can see in my place, the cup holder's helpful to carry components of the car in. But basically, if you put any sort of drink here, if it's any bigger than like a small tin, it's just gonna get knocked over. Now the problem is, is when your arm's sort of here, where the handbrake is, if you wanna slide your armrest forwards, you can't because this is in the way, or you would knock this over. So really a very good design now what I do like about this although it also does crush your fingers if you're not careful is the free stage adjustable armrest now also another problem is, is when the when you pull the handbrake up it also hits on here so again not the best design but this is nice to size backwards and forwards now what you do is if you pull this latch you've got a decent size cup holder lovely but if you pull this it brings it folds up into a higher level so you've then got an armrest and that is the armrest level i have it at which is perfect for this and actually the driving position here with the gear knob is actually lovely now this model there we go has a sat nav unit 
the other stock ones will have a sort of plastic unit with uh, car related information on there but it's such a nice premium touch they've added to the vehicle along with this lovely clock now this also comes with these or oh, the larger sorry center dial which gives you driver information sat nav location speed etc etc now the normal cars have the smaller one so it's well worth hunting for a car with this option now included with that package weirdly enough we're gonna have to go outside the car are these xenon self-leveling headlights so as you can see those are xenons and they actually are really decent the self-leveling as well and they're super bright they also come with the washers and the bumper as well they come together as part of that pack so you have been to tell if one of these cars has that pack normally because they go together although in some situations you can spec just this and not that and spec that and not this but in this model anyway they've come together anyway this is the asphalt is top model so as we're down the side you can see the 340 mm brake disc i was telling you about so that is how you can tell apart a gt from a sports model now the sports model is the cheap model that comes with less to spec cloth seats and the smaller brakes so that's how you can already tell now these aren't the biggest either these are the medium sized ones at 340 and you have the r that comes through at uh, two, uh, 378 roughly i think they are 72 or something like that we're not talking about the r we're talking about the thp 200s there we are that is my little walk around the car and uh yeah it's just such an amazing car to look at you just can't fault but this car really does stand out especially with a few tasteful modifications like i've done to mine now the jet wash does appear to be free so you're going to jump onto my chest that's a beating beat into it again and you're going to come with me and give this car a clean so as you can see here not all human beings are ideally very thoughtful harmful for others so i mean at least you sort of semi split these up for me but leaving them on the floor is not really the way to leave it but he has actually split them for me so actually in a way i've got to bend down my fat ass to pick it up but he's uh saved me the hassle around to split it all so yeah always make sure you split off your jet wash bits before you start doing the jet wash otherwise quite simply you lose a lot of time trying to take them all apart so we're going to get rid of the scratchy brush of death because we do not like that and unfortunately with the paint on this car uh, i'm also even chatting shit to you if you scratch this car badly, you have to paint the whole panel again because you can't polish it out, otherwise you'll turn the whole car gloss. So uh, I do take a fair effort in trying to uh, reduce the scratches. Okay, so practicality of getting in the rear seats. What is rather annoying is that in my seating position, you're going to be getting no one in there. I can tell you that right now. If I try and do that, yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay, so we want to get our little child, our dog, our, I don't know, bag of rice, stack of brie, baguette, I don't know, in the back. We've got to do this. Right, we're just going to get you in the back now. Yep, still going. What a great time to have a phone call. Still going. There we go. And we open that out nice and wide and still it's not much of a gap. So I'm going to demonstrate now to you while I've got a phone call in the car of how you get in the back of here as a passenger who is 5'8". So I do apologise. I look about as sweaty as a sausage roll in a bakery if not worse but anyway we're going to get in so i've got my tripod so i'm having to go free camera so there's no there's no way no no spare getting in my foot's still there okay 
we are. Right, that's my feet in. Now my head, if you can see, I'm uh, pretty shrugged up here. If I, I can't actually extend my head because it's gonna hit the top of the, uh, the window. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna close down the seat. This is in the furthest forward position. And as we can see, I'm sat in, but leg room is very non-existent. Um, at the same time, my legs are also spread. Then I can't, I can't actually physically, I can't physically put my legs together. Um, and yeah, so that is me sat in the back of my own RCZ, looking like a total sack of potatoes. And there is how far forwards the seat is compared to the other one. Now, getting behind there, you know, is not going to happen. And getting back out is just the same so hopefully you've picked up just from that video that this car isn't very practical in the sense of carrying really anything in the back seats so now i'm going to get back out which i think i'm going to do what i did in the way in which is to squeeze my leg out without breaking it out of here <laughs> i'm actually stuck Oh no, I've dropped the ca I even dropped you guys as I was trying to get out there. So, if that doesn't tell you enough how not practical it is in that sense, then that'll tell you. And then obviously if you want to get your seat back into the matching position with the other one, you have got to wait another eternity until it finally reaches the same point as the other seat. So yeah, not very practical in that sense. And then go back, so you have to sort of come out of the menu and go back around in the menu. But this one's got the RCZ branding, whereas the other one's just got a sort of like, a, obviously the stock cars come with normal height adjustable. And I think, you know, when you look at this car as a whole, which has Hiller thing heated mirrors. Um, so now you can see as well, that's like to unlike any other light. When it comes to reliability, hands down, the diesel is the one to go for. Now, if you follow these recommendations, I cannot guarantee you'll get a THP that is completely perfect. But if you do follow this, it will give you a better idea of what to look for and how to protect yourself from a rogue THP engine. So there's two variants. There is the THP 156, which is more common in the sports models, but you also get them in the GT. This is a 200 THP. Now to quickly touch on the 156, not only is it a lesser performing engine, it's gonna require you more money to modify it to be even the same performance as this engine. And actually on the turbo setup on the 156 and the general engine setup, you will not be able to get the gains and the performance that the 200 THP can. Equally, the 156 has been an engine that has been with Peugeot at this time when they were made for longer than what the newer engine has, and it has had a lot of issues. So the 156 is one to avoid, unless it is the only option in your budget. If you have to buy one, then follow the guidelines at the end of this little short video, and that will run you through what you need to look for for the THP engines altogether. Now the 200 THP is the next generation. This features Vanos, unlike the older engine, and it has an entirely new turbo setup, which aids flow with a bigger turbo as well and you know with that vanos improves performance now the thp engine isn't also without faults just like the 156 but a lot of those faults you get with the 156 have been eradicated in the 200 or at least lessened in the 200. now talking about the thps generally these are my tips to you to find yourself an absolute cushy thp first of all the most important thing above all else is the service history now if this car hasn't been regularly changed with oil and fluids um, at least every four to eight thousand miles depending on use of the vehicle and whether it's been remapped and etc etc stay well clear actually frequent oil changes and maintenance is probably better than anything else that you can get as an attribute towards buying this car if it hasn't got a decent service history if you haven't got proof of decent um, oil changes, decent quality parts fitted to the vehicle, I would not even bother to start off with. Um, these engines can mess up with just being ran on crap oil, dirty oil. They can actually lose timing and a variety of other things can happen with the engine just by running that. They get clogged up, 
and they're just awful. Vanos solenoids don't work probably, yeah. So if it hadn't been looked after in that sense, it hadn't been serviced, it hadn't been looked after, don't even bother. Some more important things to look out for, which are probably more catastrophic in the short term than the oil, are the following things. So if the oil and stuff is decent, that is a tick in the box. Now we're looking out for two rattles when we're starting the vehicle cold. Always check a THB cold, we're checking for two rattles. One rattle is the timing chain. Evidently the timing chain is very obvious when cold and it will rattle along the top of the engine. There's plenty of videos on YouTube showing you how that sounds. Now timing chain issues are less prominent in the 200 but they're still very prominent in both engines. There's, revised, uh, there's a revised chain and tensioner setup on the 200 which does eradicate the issue a little less but it's still a very serious one. Now the second rattle was on the turbo. You need to check out for the wastegate. If you've got a car that doesn't seem to be picking up, um, you don't seem to be hitting any boost, or it doesn't seem to pull like it should, plus engine management lights and so forth, then you've got a knackered wastegate. Now, normally with a knackered wastegate, you'll find on this on the turbo on these that you won't get an engine management light, but you'd continuously get an engine warning light come up because the car's not picking up the right boost levels from the turbo. But it's not enough, like a sensor, for the thing to go, oh, there's a fault. So you'll find with a wastegate rattle, you won't know what it is, and it will, you'll, well, you will know when you take the turbo off. Uh, another easy way to check, if you do buy one, is just to take off the downpipe, the three nuts at the top, and you can look in and have a little wiggle on the wastegate, see if it's all cushy, which is important. So maintenance, timing chain, wastegate. Some other ones that aren't so obvious are proof of the thermostat housing being changed. Check around the thermostat housing down the right-hand side of the engine and check for no leaks and bits like so. At the same time, you want to check the high pressure fuel pump has been done or just check and make sure the car runs properly. You know, when you take it out for a drive, let it warm up obviously and take it out for a decent spin and see if you can assess whether the car's got any engine management lights or running issues. Um, issues you'll get with the uh, high pressure fuel pump, apart from the obvious not starting when it gets quite severe, is you will have limp mode, you'll have it sort of flatten out when you put your foot down, hesitate and you'll find fuel consumption is dreadful. Now, the high pressure fuel pump with all the THPs I've owned has never been an issue, so I've been very lucky with that. But I can definitely say the chain and the um, wastegate rattle on the turbo is definitely two things that are fairly common. Now, there are a variety of things that are also, I'm gonna get a taxi or something, there's a guy in a van reversing right up in front of me here. Um, you may never see me again, is he gonna hit my car? Is he going to block me in? I don't know what's going on here. Oh, he's going. So we could talk all day about things to spot, but that is the main important one, or important things to look for in the engine. Some other small side notes, these cars, most of them, run 19s. When you're on the motorway, or at a higher speed, try and test the car at 60 mile an hour or plus where possible on your test drive. You want to see if you've got excessive vibration through the steering wheel, now you can test this by obviously you'll feel the vibration for the steering wheel but if you let go or hold it with just your fingers on one hand you'll see the, the steering wheel vibrate and I'll normally suggest with these that it's potentially had a buckled wheel or the um, brakes are warped or the um, wheels aren't balanced. Now I've had this experience before with a lot of 19s both on these RCZs and it's literally been down to them being balanced so just be aware if you have that just to check over the wheels if you can to make sure there's no buckles in them. Um, and you probably will need to get them balanced, that's normally all it comes down to, but it's fairly common. It's a fairly common complaint you see on the page. Now, amongst all other things, there will be a variety of other issues with the RCZ, but we're not going to go into those. We're just going into the main few little ones that you've seen there. So overall, the THP 200 is a very reliable engine, but it does require a bit more love and a bit more maintenance than the diesel would for it to run decently. I'm hoping from that video you've now gathered some of the things you need to check when you're looking at a THP in general, whether it's a 156 or a 200. So in my honest opinion, if you want completely trouble-free motoring, or as best as you can be trouble-free, get a diesel. I know with the THPs, they are very sensitive, and this does cause problems. And I have had to have little pernickety changes of parts and things throughout time. But in all fairness to the THP, 
compared to the diesel, when it is working and when you've got them running really well, they are an impeccable performer and they do drive and sound really, really incredible. So in my opinion, I wouldn't be put off by a 200 THP. I would still buy one, but just make sure you do the relevant treks and you're very sensible about your purchase before you go and buy one. So for any of you that don't know what the 200 looks like or how to differentiate the 200 and the 156, it will say on top of here. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you know, if the plate's missing, then look for the diagonal facing coil packs rather than straight on the 156. And the more important thing is you'll see the turbo comes in and out the same direction. With the 156, the turbo pipe goes up around the top of the turbo, down from here, in the inner corner, around and back up, rather than around continuously. So this is the engine, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how to improve the performance from this engine and from this car across the board. Just to sort of finish off the engine side of things. So if you wanna skip on, you're all the welcome to now, because this isn't really the review as such. This is more just a few little recommendations on how to make this car a hell of a lot quicker. So straight away, this intake pipe, Peugeot have decided the air to go from here, through to here, all the way up to here, through a sensor and into the turbo. Now that's great, but these pipes I could cook an egg off of right now. This is the height of summer, of course. But there's a lot of heat soak, and that is an issue. Now what you want to do is you want to buy the older style intake kit for the 207 GTI, which has a pod filter that will come to here. Now the only problem is, this newer engine has the sensor up here for your airflow going into your filter. So you're going to have to buy an extension lead of about a metre to run it down into the arch. You'll then buy this kit, which has all the hose attachments to it. You'll then run a 90 degree bend down into there. You've then got a cold air feed. That's going to lower your intake temperature straight away. Secondly, you can get a John Cooper Works intercooler for the front of this. The two, uh, on the 200, the intercooler is weighs about twice the size of the 156, which is why it performs better and why these engines last longer. But the John Cooper Works in the cooler will benefit the car massively. So you can do that again to reduce your intake temperatures. Now, this engine is ridiculous. It's been sat here for 10 minutes and I can still cook a steak off of that turbo. What you want to do is buy the forged turbo blanket to sit on here and it reduces the engine bay temperatures by well over 50%. What that does anyway is stops this ridiculous heat soak onto your air filter and this reduces obviously the temperatures again your intake temperatures which is what you want to bring down as best you can a to protect the engine b for performance and again you want to stop this excessive heat because it ends up melting now what they've done in the newer 200 is they put this metal plating here to stop it but normally it ends up melting through the top of the plastic engine cover <laughs> don't ask me why but it's a plastic one so that's also an issue so that's what you could do in the engine bay to increase performance if you want to increase noise Obviously you've got your air filter and your induction kit, but behind here you can get a space of out, which I've got in mind to bring out a little bit of noise. As we are on the front of the car, I'm running down the side, we have a cat on the front of the vehicle and two silencers. Mine are both removed, the car isn't even that drony, it actually sounds excellent and it isn't even that loud, even on the motorway with the six speed. Now what you can do is if you um, do the decap pipe delete on this, this cat is worth more than a decap pipe, so go ahead and do it because it's going to cost you nothing. And you do gain around about 10 horsepower with your remap with the decap pipe on there as well. So when you couple all that together with a decent map from the only guys I recommend, e-tuners, over in Greece, I think they're from, might be Greece, I think it's Greece. Um, they're going to do all your mapping online. If you deal with them, they will get you a decent job done. And with that map, you can get around between 260 and 300 horsepower, maybe more between 260 and 280. It depends on the setup with these, and you can do them really well, and they'll run super sweet. So that is my opinion on how to make this car a little bit faster. There's one more thing, which is more maintenance based, and that is to get your inlets done at the back of the engine. The inlets are recommended to be done every 30,000 miles. Because these are a direct injection engine, they get carbonized and blocked up, and it decreases performance. So you'll find potentially a car that's on 60 to 100,000 miles could be down as much as 20% from stock power because of just the inlets being blocked. So you want to do those because it improves your fuel and it improves your performance. And that is the best way you can get the most out of this amazing engine without going down the cams route, without going down bigger turbo, without going down a lot of more harder work. So that is how to turn this car from an already awesome car into something which is truly an animal.
So the RCZ 200 THP, should you get one? Yes, you blimmin' well should. The main reason is at the moment, these are at an all time low. They are very, very cheap and very reasonably priced at the moment. And the thing is, one day these will not exist. So if you do buy one and you enjoy it for the long run, you might find that this one day will become a valuable asset, depending on what variant you go for, and depending on the mileage. My recommendation would be to buy either a pre-facelift at very low miles or a facelift model at very low miles in a THP 200 or a diesel and you might find, give it five or ten years, that it might be worth a small fortune. Is it worth buying nowadays in 2022? Yes, it completely is. Although this car isn't perfect and it isn't going to be for everyone, practicality isn't really there for the majority of people who have a family or a big friendship group or lots of animals. And the performance is also definitely there. So what it does lack in potential practicality, it gains back in performance. The flip side to that performance is it does come with a harsh ride. So be prepared if you're buying this car, it is going to be the most comfortable Grand Tourer. Not to say it's awful, because it isn't, but just be prepared that it is a very firm ride. But overall, how many of these are you going to see on the road that look like this? The RCZ is a beautiful car and it's going to forever stand out to forever stand out on the road for the rest of time. It even still looks fairly modern by today's newer car standards. So I hope you really enjoyed this review and I can highly recommend owning one of these cars. Don't be put off by what you hear, but follow and adhere to what I've told you in this video today and you can pick yourself up a THP 200 and live with very little issues. And alternatively, if the THP isn't for you, grab yourself a diesel. They're cheap on tax and they're super excellent on fuel and they are a little bit more reliable. So that is the end of my review of this amazing car that I have been lucky to own.